And our next speaker is uh, Vidya Madhavan from UIUC. And uh, Vidya is going to tell us more about uh, uranium tellurium too. So uh, please, Vidya. Okay, thanks. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's really been a nice uh, um, symposium workshop. Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about scanning tunneling microscopy studies of uranium ditelluride. Daniel gave a really, really nice talk, and so I'm, I'm really glad he, he actually touched upon very uh, many of the uh, extremely important points. So I'm going to actually give you an experimentalist pers perspective of this material. Um, okay, let me just start by talking about uh, topological superconductivity. Um, and I want to start by making an analogy to uh, ordinary uh, topological insulators, uh, where uh, let's just take the example of a quantum spin hall uh, insulator, uh, where you expect to see these topologically protected edge states. Uh, in the case of a quantum spin hall system, of course, you have helical edge states. That means you have two spin channels. And while ordinary impurities cannot scatter you from one to the other, magnetic impurities can. And this problem goes away in the case of a quantum anomalous hall insulator, where you have a chiral edge mode. And if you were to achieve such a quantum anomalous hall insulator, um, uh, at room temperature, you might be able to carry dissipationless currents because there's nothing for these channels to scatter into. So in general, the topology of the bulk of these materials determines the kinds of edge modes that you have in these systems, and these are topologically protected. So it's very similarly in a, in a topological superconductor, uh, the bulk has non-trivial topology and the topology of the bulk tells you what kinds of either surface or, in the case of two dimensions, edge modes you might have. And these, in most, in the most general case, these edge modes can be either chiral or helical. Now, a topological superconductor is a fundamentally new phase of matter. And one important thing to realize is that just like a, a, to, uh, a topological insulator, uh, uh, cannot be uh, continuously transformed into a, a normal insulator without closing and opening uh, the bulk band gap. Similarly, a topological superconductor cannot be continuously deformed into a normal superconductor without opening and closing the superconducting gap. So it's a distinct phase of matter. And one interesting thing about a topological superconductor, of course, is that these edge states that I was talking about, either uh, 1D or 2D when you have surface currents, these are composed of Majorana particles. So this is quite easy to understand why they are Majorana. Uh, you can uh, just consider a normal superconductor which has particle hole symmetry. If you want to realize Majorana particles, you want to have the condition that the creation operator is the same as the annihilation operator. So if you have a superconductor, the excitations of a superconductor are Bugolibov quasiparticles. So let's just, just play a game and set the creation and annihilation operators equal to one another. And we immediately realize that we cannot make them equal unless we somehow manage to get rid of the spin component. So, so, so for a normal singlet superconductor, uh, you cannot realize Majorana fermions easily. So, however, this problem is solved in a triplet uh, superconductor because now in a triplet superconductor, you have uh, equal spin pairing and spins are no longer a separate degree of freedom. So this just tells you in a very hand-waving way why in a triplet superconductor, it's easy. Uh, in fact, it's a really great platform to realize Majorana modes. Okay. So the problem is that there are very few intrinsic spin triplet superconductors in ambient solids. We have some candidates. Uh, these are a few examples. Strontium ruthenate, of course, is now, I think I might have to take this off from this list because there's mounting evidence that it might be a singlet superconductor. It's still interesting, I believe, because it might break time reversal symmetry. However, it's, uh, it may not be what we thought of as a triplet superconductor. In any case, there are a few other examples. 
And one common theme is that a lot of them are uranium compounds. In fact, there's old studies uh, from the 1980s that tells you, tell you that if you want to look for a triplet superconductor, you want to look in the vicinity of ferromagnetism. Um, and uranium ditelluride happens to be this N compound, which is not, which doesn't have long range ferromagnetic order, but it, it must have ferromagnetic fluctuations. So uh, uranium ditelluride was known as a compound. It was known as a heavy fermion compound for many, many years. But it was not known to be superconducting until Shang Ran, uh, Nick Butch, and uh, John Pier Paglioni uh, discovered that in 2018 that below 1.5 Kelvin, it actually becomes a superconductor. Uh, you've already seen some of this from Daniel's talk, so I won't go into it very much. I uh, just want to mention that uh, in addition to uh, you know, the HC2 being extremely large, as he was mentioning, Night shift is also quite uh, unchanging across TC. I think there's some recent data that shows maybe a small change, but it's extremely small compared to what you would expect for a single superconductor. So if you combine the, the night shift data with, the, with all of these uh, reentrant phases at high magnetic fields, which are often seen in, uh, in these uranium-based superconductors, um, as well as with the large HC2, you begin to believe that this might indeed be a triplet superconductor. One interesting thing in this compound, it's an uh, interesting unsolved mystery. Uh, if you look at the specific heat, it has a large residual value at uh, close to, uh, at very low temperatures below TC. Um, however, I think the thermal conductivity doesn't show the presence of free carriers. So the, the, this large residual specific heat, I, I believe uh, we, don't, we still don't know what it comes from. In um, any case- really, uh, it, 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 yes? Just to make sure I understand. So the, 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 the black dots on the on panel V are the night shift? And the, and the, you yes. think it's, it's not changing. So, so just because we've all been burnt by this, have they yeah. checked that it's independent of the RF power? Uh, yes, so one thing I do want to mention is that this is a very good metal. It's got a lot of it's got a lot of heavy uh, electrons, and uh, I think that one of the problems with strontium ruthenate, I believe, I'm not sure, is that uh, the the conductivity was is lower, so the heat wasn't carried away as quickly. Um, I think strontium ruthenate is a really good metal. It's a good metal, but still the the. I, so I'm not a I'm not an expert in this, but in any case, I think, uh, I. I think they have, well, at least let me put it this way, two different groups have measured uh, this, both, um, you know, the original paper as well as the, the Japanese have now measured this, and these measurements were done after the strontium ruthenate experiments, so I'm hoping that they checked carefully. I cannot be sure, though. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I, 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 I cannot imagine, it's been a year and a half since the original uh, measurements were done. And if, if they had to, you know, just make a discovery that this is wrong, they would have done it by now, I suspect, uh, given, given what's happening with strontium glutamate. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so I'm going to take this data at face value and, uh, you know, assume that this is almost non-changing across TC, uh, and combined with everything, I think there's strong evidence for it being a triplet superconductor. Of course, the question now is, as uh, Daniel was talking about, what is the actual order parameter, uh, the, uh, the spatial part of the wave function? And the other question is, is it a chiral uh, superconductor in the sense that is time reversal symmetry broken? Uh, of course, Kerr effect seems to suggest that time reversal symmetry might be broken, but I'll, as, as you all know, these are early days. Um, this, this is just a very short list of papers. The only reason I want to show you this is because I just want to say there are enough papers now that I cannot do justice in my talk to referring to all of these. So forgive me if I haven't actually mentioned one of your papers, if you're in the audience. Okay, so I'm going to constrain um, this talk to scanning tunnel microscopy on uranium ditelluride. Uh, we obtained really beautiful single crystals from Shangran uh, and Nick Butch at NIST. 
Uh, the STM work was spearheaded by my former postdoc, Ling Zhao, with the help of uh, Sean Howard, Jenny Yu Wang, George, Rod George Rodriguez, and Anuva Aishwarya. We had a really critical theory support from Zikian Wang at Boston College, Manfred Siegrist, and we are currently working with Barry Bradlin to understand our data even further. So we have a bunch of STMs in my group. The, this work was done with this uh, 300 millikelvin Levin Tesla uh, system. It's actually a commercial system from Unisoku in Japan. Okay, so let me just start with the crystal structure. As Daniel said, it's orthorhombic. So this is what it, the unit cell looks like. Um, if you look at this unit cell, it's not at all obvious that this crystal is going to cleave, but in fact, it does cleave. And this is what the surface from STM looks like. Now, I have to say that the fact that we have these dots doesn't mean that the uh, crystal per se is dirty. Sometimes when you cleave a crystal, you can, just the nature of the cleave, you can have uh, impurities that exist only on the surface. So the first question you have to ask is, if this is the surface that we are looking at, which plane is, are we cleaving at? And in fact, we know from multiple evidence, I'll, and I'll show you that in a second, that the plane is this one. It's parallel to the 0, 1, 1 plane. So if you look along this plane, you, this is t there are two tellurium atoms that you should see. One is this light blue one, and the other is this uh, other blue tellurium atom. So in fact, that's what we see. Uh, we see chains, tellurium chains, and in between these chains hiding, we don't see this in our STM topography, are the uranium atoms. Okay, so how do we know this is the plane? We know this from two pieces of evidence, actually three. One is, one is the fact that you see these chains of tellurium. The other is that the distance between these chains of tellurium should, in theory, uh, according to the crystal structure, be 15.3 angstroms, and our data shows 15.5. Also, the unit cell step heights that we see are about 5.5 angstroms, which is consistent with the crystal structure, which should, shows 5.6 angstroms. So from, this, from all of these pieces of data, we know that we are cleaving along this particular plane. Um, okay, and the one thing I do want to mention uh, before I go ahead is that uh, the ARPAS data from Andrew, Andrew's group was not obtained along this plane. In fact, I believe that they cleave uh, along the C-axis. And I think that they take a lot of trouble to cleave along a different plane. Um, Okay, so let's first talk about the normal state because the normal state by itself is extremely interesting. Uh, this is a heavy fermion compound that you can see this from the fact that the resistivity actually increases with decreasing temperature. And that is because you have these local moments in this compound and the conduction electrons scatter off of the local moments and the scattering strength you can, uh, you can think of the scattering strength ex effectively increasing the decreasing temperature and that's why the resistivity increases. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, you, you can see uh, signs of, uh, of the coherence forming at low temperatures by the susceptibility data. You can see this downturn uh, in the B direction below about 30 Kelvin. So why is it interesting that it's a heavy fermion compound? Uh, so in a single impurity condo effect, you know that uh, the, the localized spins interaction interact with the conduction electrons, and below a certain temperature known as the corner temperature, they give you a sharp peak in the density of states that lives right at the Fermi energy. And below this condo temperature, so, so uh, in this case, however, we have a lattice of uh, localized moments, and uh, we know that below the coherence temperature, you get a similar peak in the density of states close to the Fermi energy. And this band that, this is an emergent band of, in this case, F electrons that you get with, it's a very heavy band right at the Fermi energy. And it's important to realize that this band exists because it probably affects superconductivity. So let's ask, what do we see when you, we take X STM spectra? And um, what we find is um, this zero is the Fermi energy. This is the density of states on the y-axis. 
And, and this energy scale is pretty large. Uh, it's, you know, tens of a million electron volts on either side of the Fermi energy. So very close to the Fermi energy, we find this strange feature in the density of states. And we know from earlier XTM experiments that this feature actually is a, is a far node resonance. And it indicates the presence of a sharp peak in the density of states close to the Fermi energy. So the reason we see the strange line shape is because uh, the sharp peak in the density of states that comes from this flat F band, uh, this emergent F band below the coherence temperature, uh, that band doesn't couple very well to the tunneling electrons. So in this particular case, the tunneling electrons uh, that go into the solid, uh, you know, they have some small probability of going into this band, and they have an equally good probability of going into the other conduction electrons available to them. So these two tunneling processes actually interfere with one another and give you this funny line shape. Uh, this was first seen on single impurities on the surface of gold. And the, this, the line shape has a very well-defined formula. And in fact, you can fit the, the Spano uh, resonance that you see uh, and obtain the uh, condo temperature. Um, so similar line shapes have been seen in other heavy fermion compounds. Uh, you can see many heavy fermion compounds. Zero is the Fermi energy, and you get this Spano line shape. And so we use the same uh, Fano formula. And in fact, we use many different formula to fit this, uh, this line shape near the Fermi energy. And from all our fittings, we can obtain a coherence temperature of 30 Kelvin and also a width uh, of around a few millivolts uh, for this, this band that lives right at the Fermi energy. So we do have a heavy band living at the Fermi energy and it's probably composed of F electrons. Okay. So now let's, let's zoom in to very low energy scales, which is within one millivolt of the Fermi energy, and look for signatures of superconductivity below TC. And so, so uh, please be aware that now we're zooming into very, very small energy scales. And now when you do that, this, these are spectra, oh, sorry about that. These are spectra obtained along a line in this direction going across the sample. And you can see the, uh, the presence of a particle hole symmetric shallow gap uh, centered at the Fermi energy. So just to give you a sense, so here's this shallow gap that I was mentioning. Uh, with the same STM, we also obtained data on uh, another superconductor, uh, MOTSE, which has a similar TC. And you can see that that gap, even though it doesn't go to zero, is much, much deeper than the one that we see on uranium ditelluride. So a natural question would be is, uh, how do you know this, that this is a superconducting gap? Uh, first, of course, it's particle hole symmetric, but the coherence peaks aren't very sharp. Uh, so we did quite a few experiments to, do, to make sure that this is indeed the superconducting gap. Uh, one thing is that it does disappear with magnetic field uh, at 10 Tesla, it's almost gone. And this is very close to the HT2 along this particular direction in our samples. Also, we took a, a, a one nice crystal, did Lowe measurements to make sure that it's all in the same phase, uh, did specific heat measurements to see a nice superconducting transition, and then did STM on the same sample. And this is STM spectra as a function of temperature and you can see that corresponding to the TC here, this gap disappears above, uh, you know, around 1.7 Kelvin. Okay, so, so uh, just, this is just an interesting observation. What we find in the sample is that both this, con this, uh, this condo feature, this, this feature that you see close to EF, as well as the superconducting gap, they change in magnitude as you go across the, the sample within one unit cell. Uh, in fact, this kind of change of this uh, condo resonance was seen in uh, another heavy fermion compound, uh, uranium ruthenium to silicon two, but I'm not exactly sure what this comes from. It might just come from the, the fact that you have different orbitals coupling to the tip. Okay, so, um, so certainly from all of the data I've shown you uh, so far, it looks like the superconducting state is unconventional. 
because you don't expect to see Oscar. Yeah, a, yes. a, just a, a, a short question from uh, Pavel uh, Volkov. Uh, so uh, does the superconducting gap fill in or, or close as a function of temperature? Ah, that's a really good question. Let me actually go back. So this is hard for me to tell. The, the reason is the following. Um, you know, in order to answer that question, I would have to fit this gap. And fitting this gap is non-trivial. The, 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 the gamma that you need to use, the, the, you know, the scattering rate that you need to use to fit this gap is gigantic. It's a very shallow gap. So I, 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 I don't know the answer to the question because fitting is not a good, you know, I, I cannot, yeah, so sorry about that. Just fitting this gap is, you can get, you can fit it in all kinds of different ways. You can use uh, different, you know, you can use a P wave gap, you can use an S wave gap, you can use a large gamma, small gamma. It's, it's very, very tricky to fit this gap. Okay. Mm. All right. So, so yes, so, so we have, uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on here. We have potential triplet superconductivity. Uh, we have a quantum critical behavior. I didn't show you data for that, but there's already a lot of papers showing evidence for, for quantum critical behavior. We have uh, potential broken time reversal symmetry from the Kerr effect. Uh, it's possible that this, this uh, material has non-unitary pairing. And so, uh, so the question is, what else can we learn from our STM studies? And also, if this is indeed a topological superconductor, that is time reversal symmetry is broken, um, then do we see any evidence for uh, boundary states? Okay, so the one nice thing about STM is that you can go to the edges, step edges, and you can look for um, Andreev bound states. Um, and in fact, as it turns out, it turns out Andreev bound states can tell you a lot about the superconducting order parameter. So, uh, so, so, so the Andreev process is that you have, um, you know, a Cooper pair in the superconductor encountering an interface and then getting reflected, and in the in this process acquiring a phase, and then depending upon the phase that the Cooper pair acquires you can have either constructive or destructive interference between the incoming and outgoing pairs of uh, uh, quasi-particles. So this, 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 this kind of interference is exactly like you would uh, find in any interference process. And you can, you can actually tell, depending upon your order parameter, uh, what kind of uh, Andreev bound states you would get as at an edge. For example, for a D-wave superconductor, uh, if this is your order parameter and if your step edge is in this direction with respect to the order parameter, then you expect to see a zero bias Andreev bound state. Whereas for this geometry, where the step edge is 45 degrees, you don't expect to see an Andreev bound state. For a P-wave superconductor, on the other hand, uh, no matter what the direction of the step edge with respect to your order parameter, you always expect to see step edge states. And in fact, you can show that these states actually span the superconducting gap and are indeed the uh, chiral or helical edge modes that you would find for a topological instance. So they're the same thing. So, so spectroscopy on boundaries, edges and surfaces can give you a lot of information on the order parameter symmetry. So in this is uranium ditelluride. Sometimes we see beautiful surfaces like this, and sometimes we see steppy surfaces like this. And if you zoom in, here's, um, here's a terrace. So here's a step up and then a step down on, on this side. So you can take spectra coming from a, a far away from the step edge, going close to the step edge, and this is what the spectra look like. What you must focus on is that close to the Fermi energy, Far away, you know, it's hard to see the superconducting gap here, but close to the step edge, you begin to see the emergence of this feature really very close to the Fermi energy. So here's the data again. 
So this number one is this red spectrum. You see a superconducting gap. It's shallow as usual. As you approach the step edge, you see the emergence of this, uh, this funny feature, uh, which lies inside the superconducting gap. Okay, so what we found interesting, interestingly is that if you, depending upon the direction of the step edge, in fact, depending upon the direction of the normal to the step edge, whether the normal points one way or another way, you can get this feature to appear either below the Fermi energy, so these are the spectra along this edge, or above the Fermi energy. These are spectra along this edge. Okay, so this is like a step up and then step down. This normal points this way, and so the feature is above the Fermi energy. This normal points this way, and the feature is below the Fermi energy. And this is true no matter what step edge we look at, it's universally true. So for example, this is a trench, and once again, the normal in this case points in this direction towards the right, and then you see the feature above the Fermi energy. And here you see the feature below the Fermi energy. So what is this feature and how is it connected with superconductivity? The first thing I wanna mention, like I said before, is it, uh, these, these features appear inside the superconducting gap. Uh, also, there is particle hole symmetry. So at, for any given spectrum, of, you don't see uh, you know, its partner on the other side, but if you compare these two spectra, these two features are exactly at the same energy. Another interesting uh, aspect I wanna point out is you have a peak which is, uh, you know, the superconducting gap is around 230 MeV. This peak is at around 200 millivolts, uh, mi microvolts, I mean, microvolts below the Fermi energy. On the other side of the Fermi energy, uh, there's actually a dip where a peak should be. So in many ways, there is particle hole symmetry embedded in these features, but it does break particle hole symmetry, and I'll come back to that in a, um, a little later. The interesting thing that is that these in-gap states have a handedness, um, and in fact, they're chiral. So depending upon the direction of the normal to the step edge, they either go one way or another way. So, um, so, so we did a few more tests to make sure that this was a consequence of superconductivity. So the first thing is you check temperature dependence. So if you look at temperature dependence, Tc is around 1.5, 1.6 Kelvin, and the feature disappears right around Tc. Uh, we also looked at magnetic field dependence. So here, uh, is, so here, if you the red, the red here means uh, this spectrum, and the blue here means this density of states. So on these two step edges, you can see these high density of states features, and as you increase magnetic field right around 10 Tesla, when the superconducting gap goes away, these features also disappear. So we have these chiral in-gap states that are very insensitive to, you know, the actual termination of the, um, the, the surface, but very sensitive to the direction of the normal uh, that exists on the edges. And so, it, so combined with evidence of triplet pairing, it looks like the, uh, we have evidence for this being a helical or chiral uh, superconductor. Okay, so uh, what, we can do one more thing with STM. We don't have step edges only in one direction. In fact, we find step edges at 45 degrees as well. And like I was telling you before, for a, in general, for a, a sort of a a, not a D-wave, but a P-wave superconductor, or a chiral superconductor, let me put it that way, you should see in-gap states no matter what the step edge orientation. So if you look at the 45 degree step edge in the system, you see a very particle hole symmetric feature which emerges right at the Fermi energy. Okay, um, this, is, um, this is the work uh, this is a Kerr effect paper. I just wanted to flash this because uh, Daniel's already spoken about this. But essentially, uh, the, the, they make a few important points. One is that uh, that this might there is a lot of evidence to show that this might be a wild superconductor with Fermi arc surface states. 
So the question is, how do we explain our data uh, in, on the basis of these Fermi-arc surface states? Um, the answer is, it's not that simple. So a lot of features of our data point towards the existence of chiral modes. However, the line shape of our data is very difficult to understand. Uh, in a superconductor, you should have particle hole symmetry. If you, if you stop at any given point uh, and, you, and you integrate in a small area about that point, you should, you should restore particle hole symmetry. Even for the uh, quasi-particle excitations for a superconductor, they should be particle hole symmetric. In our case, if you look along one step edge, you've completely lost particle hole symmetry. You have a peak on one side and a dip on the other. So this is a problem. The question is, how do you explain this line shape and where, what about particle hole symmetry? Um, yeah, uh, so so uh, you, you've been talking for 30 minutes, so I just want okay. to- I'm done, actually. Uh, yeah. So just, this is what- Should have given you uh, earlier more, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, please. So so the, so the yeah, just, just a couple of things. I just want to point out that this line shape is very intriguing and then I'll stop. So the step edge breaks inversion symmetry, but that's not enough. So let's say you had these kinds of um, either surface states or edge states, then broken in inversion symmetry would still give you states both above and below the Fermi energy at any given point. So, so what we find is that the only things that we can think of to explain these kinds of edge states is that you need some kind of chiral dispersing states but that is also not sufficient. You also need a way to only selectively see uh, states above the Fermi energy for one of the step edges and states below the Fermi energy for the other step edge. In any case, what I'm trying to say is that the line shape is not understood. And I believe that if we could actually understand this line shape, it would provide important information about the superconducting order parameter. Okay, I think I'm done. Uh, it's a very interesting system. It's a heavy fermion compound. There's a lot of open questions. It sounds as though it might be a non-unitary superconductor. Uh, that might explain the residual specific heat, but it doesn't explain the thermal conductivity. Uh, there's evidence for broken time reversal symmetry and theory suggests it might be chiral. More work needs to be done. Uh, there's, you know, it's uranium ditelluride, so spin orbit coupling is presumably important, but we need to really understand the role of spin orbit coupling in the system. And Una was asking, is this a quasi 2D or a 3D uh, electronic structure? We actually don't know. It might be both. It might be one or the other. There's a lot of uh, missing information on this uh, material. And that's it. I'm done. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so there's a question from uh, Yishuan. Yeah. Ah, so very nice talk. I just have a very simple question uh, regarding to the uh, edge mode that you also, I think, briefly touched upon for the end. Yeah. Um, I understand that it has a strange shape that are locally particles asymmetric. Yes. Um, I guess you already pointed out the, the, the curiosity of that. But my yeah. question is, uh, furthermore, um, the fact that the dip and hump are opposite for two edges, yeah. uh, how should we understand that this is related to the uh, opposite chirality of the two edge mode? Are there any uh, apparent uh, connection between these two statements? And uh, so, the, so we tried to understand this line shape and the, the, we came up with one scenario. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, let me just. So the one scenario we could come up with is the following. We said, okay, let's say you have, uh, you have this uh, uranium ditelluride. Uh, let's just for a second assume that the chiral axis is along the A axis, which is what we thought uh, initially due, uh, from the specific heat measurements, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, there are point nodes along the A axis, perhaps the chiral axis is along the A axis. I'm not sure about this, but in any case, if you assume this, then there should be surface currents running uh, in this compound. This is these chiral currents running in one direction, right? Let's say they're running in this direction. And these, these chiral um, uh, currents, I mean, the dispersion should look like this, just one branch, a linear dispersion. Now, if you go on the edge, perhaps uh, 
when you tunnel into the edge, if you tunnel into one edge, uh, you know, you, you, you have these electrons that are, you know, the, the electrons going this way might be slightly blocked compared to the electrons going this way. Mm -hmm. So perhaps when you tunnel into one edge or the other edge, you pick up the states above or below the Fermi energy. So this was our cartoon picture for what might be happening in this compound. I see. We I see. still don't have a full understanding of our line shapes. Uh, I, that's the point. Yeah, I suspect like it has some, something to do with tunneling between the tip of SDM. It could be. There is another possibility. Uh, one thing this reminds me of is interference. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that there's two modes that are interfering with one another. But this, it also tells me there has to be some phase thing going on. So on one side, you have one phase, on the other side, you have the, another phase. Mm -hmm. So it's, comp I, I just cannot explain this. Yeah. I see. Very interesting. Thanks. And Peter, do you, do you, do you, do you want to follow up? Um, well, it's just a kind of a related point. Hi, hi Vidya. So hi. Yeah, I don't see how it's consistent with uh, with chirality. So if I have a chiral structure and I... Peter, I can't hear you. Peter? In, yeah, in, yeah, Peter, your, your um, line Hello? is breaking. Uh, try, try now. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Just keep Hello? going, let's see. Oh, okay. So, uh, no, I just was trying, I'm still trying to understand how this is consistent with something chiral. So if Correct. you have this trench and you have an asymmetry, a particle hole symmetry between the left edge and the right edge, if I take this trench and I rotate it by 180 degrees, then uh, I sh that should be a symmetry of the system. And this seems like, you know, it takes the, should take this state that you're tunneling to that's below the Fermi energy on one side and move it to above the Fermi energy on so the other side. So one has to then in, uh, assume that the order parameter is, uh, has picked a direction in the sample, at least in the area that we're looking at. So the, Right, so I, I can see how it's, it's consistent with like breaking of inversion with a polar vector in plane, but I don't see how it's consistent with chirality. Uh, so, so, so the thing is that if you, so what our data is saying in a nutshell is that the superconducting order parameter, uh, let me see if I can, I don't know if I have it here, that the superconducting order parameter has a vector associated with it. It's not the structure that has a vector because it's this, this, this signature that we see has to do with superconductivity. It occurs only in the superconducting phase. So, this just all I can say to you based on what we see is that the superconducting order parameter must have a vector associated with it. But, but that vector could be a helical vector. It's true. So that's why I'm saying that the next question you have to ask is how do you explain the line shape? So when you try to explain the line shape, if you simply have these, let's say you have, uh, you know, these in gap states are, um, uh, they span the superconducting gap, so they're not, I'm not thinking of them as a resonances. Instead, I'm thinking of them as dispersing states inside the superconducting gap. So if you imagine that these dispersing states ha look like this, that is, they're, they're helical states, and you break inversion symmetry, you would still have states above and below the Fermi energy. That's what I was trying to tell you before. So in okay. order to actually... Maybe, maybe, but I guess I'm asking how it's, it just doesn't seem consistent with chir or evidence for chirality in this Right, regard. so because, what I'm you know, saying again, is think... that there are only two things we can say from our data. One is that the superconducting order parameter must have a vector associated with it. And the other is that if you try to explain the line shape of these states, the only way we can think of doing it is by having chiral modes rather than helical modes. That's it. And that's all I can say. I, I just, there is, it's not smoking gun evidence. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, right, so th there's a question from Steve. Uh, yeah, um, I, I assume you've done checks, but uh, how are we sure that we're not getting 
a asymmetry from an asymmetry of the tunneling tip? I mean, presumably. Okay, so tunneling tip asymmetries. Uh, uh, yeah. So okay, I mean that it's hard to uh, imagine that they would give you something in the energy, but let's just imagine that that's some there's some crazy reason you get an asymmetry from the tip. What we've done is we've we've actually looked at I would say four to five samples with four to five different tips. Um, and in every single case, we see this. Yeah, but yes. and is, the, is the magnitude of the asymmetry more or less independent of tip? By magnitude of the asymmetry, do you mean the position of this peak and the... And or the... how pronounced it is? I mean, you know, I wasn't suggesting that this tip asymmetry has produced this, but this tip asymmetry could give you a vector which could then inter interact with the broken symmetry of the superconducting state in some way. So, so there's no indication that that's happening. Um, all the tips we've used uh, give us line shapes that look like this. They have the same okay. overall features of a peak and a dip. And depending upon the step edge, either it goes one way or another. Yeah. So there's, there's very little evidence that this is due to the tip. It could be from tunneling electrons, like the Fano resonance is asymmetric, and that comes from interference processes. And so, you know, it, the, the one possible uh, thing I was thinking was maybe you have some kind of chiral surface modes, and then you have a, a tunneling process that actually gives you. That's what I was these, thinking of too. Yeah. Um, but I, I try, the, the thing that you would need is you would need, so for Farno, for example, whether the resonance is on the left or the right uh, is determined by the relative phase between the localized state and the, the wave phase of the wave function, the relative phase of the wave function between the localized state and the conduction electrons. So here, to get this go from one side to the other, there has to be some phase thing going on, which I, I, I don't have a model for. Yeah. Thank you. There's a, a question from um, Pavel. Just, uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes. Have you observed the uh, other edge of the of the 45 degree step? Uh, it seems that in the figure you had on, only only one part of the edge. So is there another part of the edge? And the related question is whether you observed somewhere uh, corners where a step edge turns. We do, we do, and there we see a peak in the density of states. And so, so at all the corners you see a peak in the density of states at zero, or or yes, what is it? Yes, at zero. Even even if uh, let's say I don't know uh, you have like a ninety degree corner like like in the two leftmost pictures so 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 there would be a, a peak at fine binding energy on the one side a fine binding energy on the other side we, and between we've them never, we've never seen a nine, we, we don't see step edges in this direction perpendicular to this one uh -huh. so we only see step edges in this or forty five degree direction and corners uh, when do you see corners. It we see different. corners like this might meet this, uh -huh. or this might terminate or move, or uh, or you know it might. There's another 45 degree possible, right? So there are two 45 right. degrees that can give you a corner. So uh, so for for other kinds of terminations and step edges, we see peaks, uh, peak like features that are particle hole symmetric uh, inside the superconducting gap. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we're uh, running out of time, but but just a very short question from me. Uh, so just to make sure I understand, so, so this this uh, this asymmetry between the, the here the, the blue and the and the red uh, step edges. So 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 the, this means that mirror mirror symmetry is broken, right? But it's it's actually not consistent with uh, what you would call think about this Carroll edge state. That would be because they, they would preserve mirror times time reversal. So that would mean that the, the spectrum should look the same on the right and the left. So it's, it's mirror, which is really broken. It's chiral well, in that sense. It's remember, the same sense that the right and left hand are different. Yeah, yeah, but remember, we're looking at step edges where, where there's broken inversion or mirror, if you want to call it. 
right? Yeah, so, but, but so, it, it basically means that the, the uh, right step edge is not equivalent to the left step edge. For the superconductor. In, in the superconducting state. In yeah. the superconducting state, yes. So, yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, would, I would really need to, in order to explain this, I think we need, you need one more ingredient. One more thing needs to happen. Either you need to have two boundary states interfering, or you need to have some kind of a process where the tunneling electrons going in are doing something that's giving you a certain light shape. Uh, just having, just, just to say, uh, for example, if you had a 1D mode uh, spanning the superconducting gap, what you expect to see is a flat density of states inside the superconducting gap, which goes on either right. side of the Fermi energy. Right. If you take this line shape and you add them together, you get a flat density of states, just to let you know. But you can see that, that that'll happen, right? So, so it looks like we're only seeing half the, the spectrum, not the entire spectrum. And I don't understand why. Okay, so any other questions or comments? Please raise your hand. Okay, so, uh, right. Uh, so I guess in, in uh, parts of the world, it's time to go home. In other parts, it's time to start uh, your, your day. <laughs> so uh, um, thanks very much all for uh, participating. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it as, as, at least as much as I did. I, I think I, I enjoyed the uh, all the talks very, very much. And I hope to see you in the real world also sometime soon. Yeah.